Good morning. Welcome to worship with the community of Westside Unitarian Universalist Church, where compassion leads us to work for justice and equality. My name is Carol Kappa, and I'm your worship leader this morning, and I'm glad you're joining us for the service today. It's my hope that this gathering will renew your sense of community and connection and nourish your heart, mind, and spirit. I want to give a special thanks to all of our service participants today, especially our AV team volunteers, host Spencer Maxwell, and co-hosts Christina Sellers and Cindy Fountain. And also, I really want to say a big thank you to all the other Westside volunteers who make this service possible today. Our chalice lighters, the Ireland family, pastoral care representative Melissa Trask, meditation leader Diane Austin, Social Justice Chair Cindy Fountain, as well as our Director of Lifespan Religious Education, Nikki Kennedy, who provides us with the time for all ages, and our talented pianist, Dr. Yuki Kumamoto, who provides us with the unique pre-service music, prelude and offertory every week. At Westside, we are raising the next generation of Unitarian Universalists, and we want them to know that they are an important part of our community. Several years ago, we chose to be radically inclusive and to adopt a multi-generational worship where our services include all family members. So welcome to all children and youth of all ages. Westside is a community of many believers, genders and sexualities, a community of diverse cultural, racial and class backgrounds, a community of varied abilities and gifts, and some here find inspiration in the great books, others in the great outdoors, and others still in great conversations. But whoever you may be, we welcome you to bring your whole self into this community. If you're so moved, you can try out the chat feature on Zoom by typing in some words of welcome to both members and visitors who are joining us this morning. And on behalf of this church community, I say to everyone, welcome. And now I wanna introduce our new board president, Mark Hart, who wants to bring an important message to you on an announcement right now. Good morning, Westsiders. I know that many of you have been wondering about the reopening of our church and our status on finding a new minister. We would like to give you a quick update on both of these items. As you may know, we signed a severance agreement with our former minister, Reverend Frieda, and that agreement required us to pay her salary through the end of this month in July. We've also reviewed the results of this month's stewardship campaign, and this information was essential in helping us plan for our, fiscal, our coming fiscal year. You may also recall that for a contract minister for a period of six months, Sorry, you may also recall that the approved budget for fiscal year 2022 provides funding for a contract minister for a period of six months. Now we are on table. Now we are on to finding and hiring that minister. A transition team led by Tana Trask has been formed and they will be working on identifying the congregation's expectations and hopes for the next minister and will conduct the candidate search. Our goal is to have the new minister hired by January and hopefully sooner. We realize that many of you feel a pressing need for a new minister and would like to see someone in the pulpit sooner. Please be assured that we share your concern and will move as quickly as possible to find the best, find and hire the best possible candidate. We also have a task force assigned to develop a reopening process. They will be presenting their recommendations at the August 10th board meeting. We know that many members are eager to get back to in-person services. We look forward to seeing that, seeing their recommendations on how we can do this as safely as possible. As soon as we have more information on a plan and timeline, we'll be sure to share it with you. In the meantime, we encourage you to engage in any fellowship activities you feel comfortable with. This may include small group meetings outdoors or Sunday service watch parties. We also encourage you 
to be aware of current CDC guidelines regarding COVID safety protocols. Like all of you, we are getting zoomed out and we are eager to be back in our church with a new minister in the pulpit and safely back together with all of our wonderful members. Thank you for your patience and support as we work through a very, very difficult time for everyone. Please stay safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And now I'm excited to introduce our guest in the virtual pulpit this morning, Mr. Bill Holston. He has spoken at Westside before in the past, and he's the executive director of Human Rights Initiative of North Texas, a nonprofit legal aid organization. Even when U.S. administrations change, immigration problems persist. Bill Holston will take us on a tour of what's changed under the Biden administration, what still needs to change, and the effect our immigration and, and asylum laws have on people seeking shelter, safety, and hope. Since 2012, Bill has been the executive director of the Human Rights Initiative of North Texas and has provided pro bono legal representation for political and religious asylum applicants since the 1980s. He's the recipient of multiple awards and honors, including the Angel of Freedom Award by HRI, the Martin Luther King Jr. Award by the Dallas Bar Association, and Distinguished Alumni Award for Public Service by SMU's Dedman School of Law. In 2020, he was awarded the Wiseman Award by the State Bar of Texas Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Section. Bill has been a commentator for KERA and currently writes for the Dallas Morning News on immigration and human rights issues. He's also a member of the Dallas Bar Association's Pro Bono Activities uh, Committee. He's a member of the North Texas chapter of Master Naturalists. He guides hikes in the Great Trinity Forest and is an Eagle Scout and writes a column for D Magazine's front burner by, um, by blog, Lawman Walking. He's married to his best friend, Jill, a dyslexia specialist for RISD, and they have two grown sons. They're members of the Greenland Hills United Methodist Church. So I look forward to hearing from him later in the service. And now I invite you to take a deep breath. And from wherever you are, just settle into this sacred space that we create. And let us worship together as we listen to this morning's prelude performed by our pianist, Dr. Yuki Kumamoto. Thank you, Yuki. Our opening words are from Seth Carrier Ladd entitled Wind, Water, Stunt. Wind that whispers through the willow trees, sun that sustains us, water that washes over willing earth and weather stones, a smile shared and savored, 
a child squeal of delight as she dances in the daisies and daffodils, the quiet joy of gathered community. This, this is the spirit of life and love that we call forth now into this gathering. May this spirit infuse our hearts, fill our souls, and carry us forward like a wave on the ocean as we enter now into this sacred time and space. Come, let us worship together. Our opening hymn this morning is This Land is Your Land, written by Woody Guthrie. I hope you enjoy the beautiful scenes of our awesome country as we listen to the music. is going to be done this morning by the Ireland family. You may want to adjust your volume so that you can hear them better. We like this. 
to celebrate the inherent worth and dignity of every person, to reaffirm the historic pledge of liberal religion, to seek that justice which transcends mere legality and moves toward the resolution of true equality, and to share that love which is ultimately beyond even our cherished, cherished reason, that love which unites us. <laughs> and our chalice lighting song today is Be the Light by Leah Morris, which was inspired by the poem written by Amanda Gorman. There is always a light. When we're ready to see it, there's always a light. When we're ready to be it, to see the light, to be the light, to raise our eyes in the dark of night, to climb this hill, together we will. There's always a light. reciting our affirmation today. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve others in community, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with creation. Thus do we covenant with one another. And our time for all ages today was coordinated by our Director of Lifespan Religious Education, Nikki Kennedy. Good morning, Westside. I hope you guys are all well and enjoy, able to enjoy some sun this week as I sit here outside, a little bit of shade. True story comes to us from John Lewis, a great leader in this nation who died just last month. Many people were sad to lose him and thankful for all the things that he had done to bring about justice and fairness in our nation. He had lived a long and full life asking of himself and asking of all of us to show up for get your volume back. what we can yeah. and just a little bit more to make sure that there is more fairness in our country. When he was 23 years old, he spoke at the March on Washington with Dr. King. We are tired. We are tired of being beaten by policemen. We are tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? 
We want our freedom and we want it now. John Lewis grew up in a large family and he would spend time with his aunts and uncles, with his siblings and cousins. There were many children who lived in the neighborhood and they would play together. This was long before there was a pandemic and so people could play together and hang out together in person. Mr. Lewis tells us about a time when he was playing outside his aunt Senevia's house with about 14 other children when a storm, a big storm, arrived. A kind of storm that made him and everyone else afraid. I'm going to tell a story from his perspective. So it's like him talking. So when I say I, it really means John. Ansonevia was the only adult around, and as the sky blackened and the wind grew stronger, she herded us all inside. Her house was not the biggest place around, and it seemed even smaller with so many children squeezed inside. Small and surprisingly quiet, all of the shouting and laughter that had been going on earlier outside had stopped. The wind was howling now, and the house was starting to shake, and we were scared. Even Aunt Senevia was scared. And then it got worse. Now the house was beginning to sway and the wood plank flooring beneath us began to bend and then a corner of the house began lifting up. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. None of us could. This storm was actually pulling the house towards the sky with us in it. That was when Aunt Zenevia told us to clasp hands, line up and hold hands, she said, and we did as we were told. And then she had us walk as a group towards the corner of the room that was rising from the kitchen to the front of the house we walked and the wind was screaming outside and sheets of rain were beating on the tin roof. And we walked back in the other direction as another end of the house began to lift. And so it went back and forth, 15 children walking with the wind, holding that trembling house down with the weight of our small bodies. Can you imagine what it was like to have been inside that house? Afraid that it might fall apart from the destructive force of the wind and the rain from the whole storm? I'm so glad that John Lewis wasn't alone, that no one there was alone, that he was with his friends and family. I'm so glad that together they figured out a way to save the house, to save their home. When John Lewis was much older, just not that long before he died, he was writing down the story of his whole astounding life and he wrote these words. More than half a century has passed since that day and it has struck me more than once over the many years that our society is not unlike the children in that house, rocked again and again, the winds of one storm or another, the walls around us seemingly like they're going to fly apart. It seemed that way in the 1960s at the height of the civil rights movement when America itself felt as if it might burst at the seams, so much tension, so many storms. But the people of conscience never left the house. They never ran away. They stayed, they came together, and they did the best they could, clasping hands and moving towards the corner of the house that was the weakest. 
and then another corner would lift and we would go there. And eventually, inevitably, the storm would subside and the house would stand. But we knew another storm would come and we would have to do it all over again. And we did. And we still do, all of us, you and I, children holding hands, walking with the wind. Thank you for listening, not really to my story, but to Mr. John Lewis's story. Our joys and concerns will be shared today by Melissa Trask, a representative of the pastoral care team. Good morning. We are grateful you are here with us for this service. It is time in our service where we share joys and concerns. While we continue to meet online, anyone can submit a joy or concern by emailing the pastoral care team at pastoralcare at westsideuu.org or through our web form located at the program tab on the church's website, and then click on the care and support. As we share our joys with others, those joys are multiplied. When other hearts know our joy, our joy shines all the brighter. As we share our concern, our community can offer its care. When other hearts know our sorrow, our burden becomes lighter. This is a time in our service when we offer witness and support for one another's journey. This week's joys and concerns received by 10 a.m. this morning include, um, so we just have one concern um, and it's, it's a big one. And it was actually submitted by the chair of the pastoral care team, uh, Kelly Flanagan. And it says, it is with profound sadness and through tear-filled eyes that I announced the sudden passing on Thursday of my dear sweet friend, Shelly Shivers. We joined West Side together, were in small group together and quickly became a great friend. This is extremely difficult to try to in incapacitate such a great dynamic person into a few words, but here goes. Ask anyone who knew her and she was their best friend. We all thought that. And that was because Shelly was just a wonderful soul who made everyone who knew her feel close to her. She made you feel that you were the only one that mattered during the time you spent with her. Shelly was a gentle, kind, compassionate, amazing soul who was beyond supportive of her friends. She was there for me when no one else was. Ask any of her friends and they will also echo the same sentiment. That is just how beautiful a soul Shelly was. You could laugh with her because she had a wicked sense of humor, cry because she held your heart safe, and be weird and geek out about pop culture because she loves that, talk about books because she was a voracious reader, talk about music because she rocked out with the best of them, talk about animals because she fiercely loved all creatures, great and small, especially her pups. She was so easy to be with because she listened, she cared, she engaged. The world lost one of the greats on Thursday. Fly free, Shelly, my friend, pants optional. Thank you for sharing those with us. It is good to share with one another as sharing draws our community closer. Please know that our pastoral um, care associates are available to support you with deep listening and when needed through our in-reach fund for short-term financial support of members in need. We are here for you. Thank you, Melissa. This morning's centering song is Comfort Me by Mimi Bornstein, performed by Merlin Snyder 
with Randall Edwards, Trey Henry, and Deborah Snyder. And following this centering song, Diane Austin will lead our meditation of shared compassion. I invite you to join me in a time of centering. Each week here at Westside, we open our hearts to those in our community who know both joys and challenges and to all suffering beings. I will begin with a pastoral introduction before we move into a time for silent reflection. Our Tibetan prayer bowl will sound to signal the start of the time for your own meditation, prayer, or reflection, and it will sound again at the end. This meditation on compassion is from Jack Cornfield, with a little editing for our Zoom gathering. May you be held in compassion. To cultivate compassion, let yourself sit in a centered and quiet way. In this traditional form of practice, you will combine a repeated inner intention with visualization and the evocation of the feeling of compassion. As you first sit, breathe softly and feel your body, your heartbeat, the life within you. Feel how you treasure your own life, how you guard yourself in the face of your sorrows. 
Now bring to mind someone close to you whom you dearly love. Picture them and feel your natural caring for them. Notice how you hold them in your heart. Then let yourself be aware of their measure of sorrows, their suffering in life. Feel how your heart opens to wish them well, to extend comfort, to share in their pain and meet it with compassion. This is the natural response of the heart. May you be held in compassion. May your pain and sorrow be eased. May your heart be at peace. Imagine that they turn their compassionate gaze back to you and acknowledge the measure of sorrows you carry. They say to you with tenderness the same phrases. May you be held in compassion. May your pain and sorrow be eased. May you be at peace. Take in these compassionate wishes and let them touch your heart. After a time receiving their care, direct the same compassion to yourself. May I be held in compassion. May my pain and sorrow be eased. May I be at peace. Begin to extend compassion to others you know. Picture these individuals one after another. Hold the image of each in your heart. Be aware of their difficulties and wish them well. Then you can open your compassion further, a step at a time to the suffering of your friends, to your neighbors, to your community, to all who suffer, to difficult people, to your enemies, and finally to the brotherhood and sisterhood of all beings. Sense your tender-hearted connection with all life and its creatures. Relax and be gentle. Breathe. Let your breath and heart rest naturally as a center of compassion in the midst of the world. May it be so, blessed be, and amen.
Thank you, Diane. Good morning, Westside. This is so your social justice rep, Cindy Fountain. Westside's plate offering for July is Texas Equal Access Fund or T-Fund. Texas Equal Access Fund provides funding to low income people in the North, East and Panhandle regions of Texas who are seeking abortion and cannot afford it while simultaneously working to end barriers to abortion access through community education and shifting the current culture toward repro reproductive justice. Texas Equal Access Fund believes that when it comes to abortion, there is no choice if there is no access. Restrictions on abortion access and funding are discriminatory because they especially burden people with low incomes, young people, people in rural areas, and people of color. We oppose all efforts to restrict abortion rights and are committed to fighting for access to abortion for all. I'm a volunteer with T-Fund. During the freeze, I happened to be the volunteer who helped fund a young woman living out of her car. I was able to locate a warming center very near her in her rural town and T-Fund's social worker followed up with her to help her get connected to services beyond helping fund her abortion. On September 1st, Senate Bill 8 will take effect in Texas. If no injunctions are in place, it will be virtually impossible to obtain an abortion in Texas. In the meantime, T-Fund will keep doing the important work of funding and providing emotional support for those seeking abortion care. Please contribute to this vital organization and thank you. You can give online now through the church's giving page or by using the Give Plus app. You can select the service project fund and the link is put in the chat. You can also mail a check to the church. Thank you so much for your offering and now enjoy this musical offering from Yuki. Thank you, Westside, for your generosity. It always does my heart good to see how we are so much willing to reach out to people who are less fortunate. And now let's please turn our attention to Mr. Bill Holston, our guest speaker today. The title of his reflection is The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Immigration So Far in the Biden Administration.
I'd like to start, uh, start this morning with a reading of a poem by the great American poet Amanda Gorman in this place, an American lyric. There's a poem in this place and the footfalls and the halls and the quiet beat of the seats. It is here at the curtain of the day where America writes a lyric you must whisper to say. There's a poem in this place in the heavy grace, the line face of this noble building, collections burned and reborn twice. There's a poem in Boston's Copley Square where protest chants tear through the air like sheets of rain where love of the many swallows hatred of the few. There's a poem in Charlottesville where tiki torches string a ring of flame tied around the wrist of night where men so white they gleam blue seem like statues where men heap that long wax burning ever higher where Heather higher blooms forever in a meadow of resistance. There's a poem in the great sleeping giant of Lake Michigan defiantly raising its blue head to Milwaukee and Chicago, a poem begun long ago, blazed into frozen soil, starting upward in a glow. There's a poem in Florida, in East Texas, where streets swell into a nexus of rivers, cows afloat like mottled buoys in the brown, where courage is now so common that 23-year-old Jesus Contreras rescues, rescues people from the floodwaters. There's a poem in Los Angeles yawning wide as the Pacific tide where a single mother swelters in a windowless classroom teaching black and brown students and Watts to spell out their thoughts so her daughter might write this poem for you. There's a lyric in California where thousands of students march for blocks undocumented and unafraid, where my friend Rosa finds the power to blossom in dreadlock, her spirit the bedrock of her community. She knows hope is like a stubborn ship gripping at a dock, a truth that you cannot stop a dreamer or knock down a dream. How could this not be your city, Sunesion, our country, our America, our American lyric to write a poem by the people, the poor, the Protestant, the Muslim, the Jew, the native, the immigrant, the black, the brown, the blind, the brave, the undocumented and undeterred, the woman, the man, the non-binary, the white, the trans, the ally to all of the above and more. Tyrants fear the poet. Now they, we know it, we can't blow it. We owe it to show it, not slow it although it hurts to sow it when the world skirts below it. Hope, we must bestow it like a wick in the poet so it can grow lit, bringing with it stories to rewrite, the story of a Texas city depleted but not defeated, a history written that, written that need not be repeated, a history, a nation composed but not yet completed. There's a poem in this place, a poem in America, a poem in every American who rewrites this nation, who tells the story worth of being told on this minnow of an earth to breathe hope into a palimpsest of time, a poet and every American who sees that our poem pen doesn't mean our poems end. There's a place where this poem dwells. It is here, it is now in the yellow song of Dawn's Bell where we write an American lyric. We are just beginning to tell. The last time I spoke to you, I used the theme of Seamus Heaney's poem, Curate Troy, and the term hope and history rhyme. I talked about how maintaining hope during a time of a full-scale white nationalist assault on immigrant rights was difficult and that it required a long-term view of advocacy. Uh, that's true. It was true then and it's true now. And I'd like to do a couple things this morning. First of all, I'd like to talk about our organization, how we responded during COVID in this last year. And then I'd like to talk about the change in administration and some of the things that um, have changed for the better and some of the things that um, have not changed and need to change. So um, our agency is a 20-year-old organization, the Human Rights Initiative North Texas, and we perform free legal services for immigrants with um, also with integrated social services, which has come into play uh, a lot this year. We represent asylum seekers, we represent unaccompanied uh, minor children, and we represent immigrant survivors of violent crime, uh, mostly domestic violence that occurred here in the United States. And so this work has always been difficult, but it was extremely difficult in this last year during COVID. And I know a lot of you had uh, similar experiences in your work. So one of the things that was unique about how we responded to COVID, Dallas had a mandatory shelter in place 
order. And so we shifted to remote work if possible, but all, almost my entire staff, including myself, has been required to come into the office the whole time because the government didn't stop its deportation machine. So we were having to respond to written notices from the government and because our clients were hard hit by COVID, um, both by the disease and also by layoffs and reduced hours and financial impacts. And so we distributed emergency rental assistance. We um, uh, distributed emergency food aid, food, uh, grocery cards, and um, um, toiletries, all of those things. And all of that, of course, had to be delivered in person. So our social services staff has worked this entire time. And our agency has a, a little over a million dollar budget, but we uh, we distributed over a million dollars, uh, pardon me, over $300,000 in free uh, in rental assistance for our clients so that they uh, could avoid eviction. And then of course, our, we continued to uh, accept new clients, uh, do Zoom meetings with clients. We shifted to doing some remote work at the border and provided legal services for asylum seekers who were stuck in Matamoros because of some of the previous administration's policies, namely the migrant uh, protection protocols. So I'm going to go over next some of the uh, changes and, and some of the cha changes in policy that have occurred in this first period of the new administration. Uh, and some of them were dramatic changes from the assaults on immigrant rights uh, that occurred before. Now, one of the things I'll say is an introduction in terms of one of the distinctions of the prior administration, and really distinct from any, any uh, administration in recent memory, was that our immigration policies were uh, designed and written by Stephen Miller, who was an avowed white nationalist. And so for the first time in, in decades, our policies were overtly racist and overtly punitive to immigrants. And uh, so there was a lot of change that needed to occur. And some of those things have occurred. And we'll talk about, we'll start with that. Well, of course, the very first thing I think that comes to mind in terms of the prior administration, and this is one of the things that the, this administration has already changed, was the Muslim ban, was this uh, this. Uh, immigration rule, uh, executive order, which stopped uh, people from coming here to the United States. And of course, it went through three different versions before they finally found a version that could hold up in court. But uh, this resulted in, of course, uh, many, many people from primarily Muslim countries unable to come to the United States to visit their family or for business or uh, students or for many other reasons. And so that stopped. And we were very uh, pleased, of course, to see that. Every advocate I know in the immigration field uh, was at DFW airport uh, when that Muslim air, uh, and when that Muslim ban rolled out uh, trying to uh, fight it. And it was an inspiring thing to see people stand up to that. And thankfully that's gone. Next was a, a, a refugee ban from certain countries. And of course, a great reduction in our refugee numbers to historic lows of uh, 15,000 people, which was uh, the lowest number of refugees since the, <clears throat> since the refugee program began in 1980. And that refugee ban has uh, ended. Next was the public charge rule. Now, this is one of those rules that uh, doesn't, it's not quite as dramatic uh, in terms of its, um, how people viewed it, but it was hugely impactful for our clients. And that was the idea that if you took any sort of public benefit, uh, that you could be barred from eventually becoming, uh, getting a green card. And that sent waves of fear through immigrant communities. And they ceased going to public hospitals. They uh, would uh, refuse, if even if their children might be entitled to food stamps, didn't go and obtain food stamps. And so this had really, really dramatic uh, impact on, on immigrants. And the administration changed that rule uh, and, in fact, issued an executive order for agencies to review how that rule had been uh, rolled out and uh, making sure that it, it, it uh, was no longer in effect and that immigrants would not be penalized and that they could freely access public benefits. Of course, one of the nasty things about that rule is, um, is immigrants are, are particularly undocumented immigrants are unable to uh, access much in the way of benefits to begin with. So it was a particularly cruel 
uh, rule. Now, next was perhaps the worst thing, in my view, that the former administration did, and they were called the Orwellian, ironically named, Migrant Protection Protocols. Well, these protocols, of course, did nothing to protect immigrants, and it was uh, more um, called by advocates the Remain in Mexico policy. And that was if you came to the border and claimed asylum, which, of course, is legal, and that is how you can claim asylum come to the border and say, I'm afraid for my life. I can't return to my country. I'm given, I, I, I want to stay here. I want to claim asylum. And you're in historically, you've been paroled into the United States to assert that claim. Well, that remain in Mexico policy said, no, you have to wait in Mexico while your case is pending. Well, think about that a moment, how that's supposed to work. You're living in a camp in Matamoros. How do you access counsel? How do you accumulate the documents? Let's say you are a pro-democracy activist from Cuba or Nicaragua. How are you supposed to access medical records to show the injuries you received as a result of torture? How are you supposed to access a psychologist who might serve as a, give you a forensic uh, psychological exam? How are you even supposed to get notice of your court? And the answer is you're not supposed to do any of those things because this is meant to destroy the right of asylum. And worse, it subjects people to the very dangerous conditions in these border cities. And so there were many, many hundreds and hundreds of cases and individuals who were abducted, kidnapped, raped, tortured while they waited uh, for their asylum cases to proceed. And thankfully, the Biden administration ended the migrant protection protocols. And if you had asked me a year ago, what's the worst policy we have, I would have said that's it. Um, and so ending that was a big deal. But there were over 70,000 people that were stuck in that MPP program. Uh, and the administration was very slow in admitting those people. Um, and so uh, there had been something like 10,000 of those people that were actually permitted to come into the United States uh, over several months. Then most recently, the administration uh, changed its criteria a bit more. And so some of those individuals who were stuck in Mexico and didn't go to court because they uh, found it impossible to cross the border and get to the court in time for their hearing, uh, or they never received the notice of the court date because uh, they were uh, living in a in a uh, totally insecure and unstable situation in Mexico and didn't uh, receive their notice of their court date and they didn't show up and the court's now permitting uh, people that were in those circumstances to now apply for asylum. So that's a, a, a great and very welcome uh, change in, in the law, although there's still people that are uh, stuck in that MPP uh, program in Mexico. And so, of course, we're hoping that they are permitted to come into the United States at an accelerated rate. Next week, the government entered into these uh, asylum cooperative agreements, these agreements with Guatemala and El Salvador that required uh, people to apply for asylum in those countries. Well, of course, these, these countries uh, are producing refugees themselves. And so the idea that an asylum seeker uh, that had passed through that country should apply for asylum in a country where they're not safe and they're not actually able to protect their own citizens, much less refugees, was... Uh, um, well, I started to say laughable, it's, it's because, it, but it's not funny. It's absurd. Uh, and it was really only intended to deter and destroy the right to asylum. Uh, and the uh, Biden administration has withdrawn from those cooperative agreements, although troublingly has been in conversations with those countries to stop migration that occurs of people crossing their borders. Um, and of course, that was most recently illustrated in something that was very, very troubling to us in the um, um in the immigrant uh, rights uh, advocacy uh, movement was uh, Vice President Kamala Harris's trip to uh, Guatemala, where she said to people, to refugees, don't come. Well, it's very troubling to me that a political leader of our country would go to a place that's producing refugees and say, don't come. Uh, that's, uh, it's, 
it's the exact opposite of what we say we are as a country of refuge. It's, of course, completely inconsistent with the international law, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that creates a right to asylum. And it turns us back on these things that have made our country great to begin with, which is being welcoming to refugees. You know, Dallas has been totally transformed by the contribution of refugees starting in the 80s from Vietnamese, Laotian, and Cambodians that came here after the end of the war in Vietnam. And of course, more recently by Congolese and Afghanis and Iraqis that have so contributed to uh, the vitality of our city. Uh, and so um, it's very troubling that we would say anything inconsistent with uh, with welcoming people uh, uh, rather than say, don't come. Um, the next thing uh, that I'd like to talk about was, uh, which was very, very troubling. Uh, it, it's interesting. I just saw today, three years ago today, I was speaking at a rally in downtown Dallas, uh, protesting the uh, family separation policy of our government, where we were uh, literally taking children from their mothers and fathers and putting the kids in detention centers and the parents were being uh, prosecuted for a crime. And there was huge outcry all over the United States about that. And it's a great uh, it's a great example to us of how we could change policy, even the policies of a of a uh, administration that was as hostile to immigrants as the last one. They they ended those uh, that what was called the zero tolerance policy. Um, in, in some ways, uh, but the, this administration completely ended that policy, ended uh, zero tolerance, and suspended the prosecution for illegal entry into the United States. So it's a very, very welcome change, and uh, of course, um, is an indication that we're not going to do that again, um, which is, it just broke people's hearts, uh, and as it should have. Um, well, so I called my talk the good, the bad, and the ugly, and mostly what I've talked about so far is the good. I want to talk about the ugly, a little out of order, and that's refugees. I mentioned earlier that previous administration had lowered the refugee numbers to 15,000. It had been 80,000 during, during the Obama administration, which was still inadequate because this is a period of time that millions of people are displaced all over the world in other countries, uh, of course, Germany, um, uh, but other countries like Jordan and uh, Kenya had been continuing to accept refugees. The idea that a country like the United States would not use its resources to welcome refugees is, is tragic. Uh, and so uh, the Biden administration announced that it was going to raise that number, but then didn't and said that we're, we, you know, the infrastructure is not there and we're going to continue to accept 15,000 refugees. Well, there was huge outcry uh, from advocates and and once again, this shows the power of advocacy. Uh, and so the administration, I think, was taken aback with how strong the opposition was. And I'd like to make an aside here. Uh, I've, I've been an advocate in this world for, you know, 25 years. And during the previous administration, there were times people would accuse me of this being a partisan matter that I just hated the President Trump. But the fact is, we were very critical. I was very critical. Our agency was very critical of the Obama administration. We were critical of the Trump administration, and we're going to be critical of the Biden administration if it doesn't uh, stand up for the rights of immigrants and refugees. So this is not a, a partisan matter. This is advocacy around human rights and advocacy for us to live up to what we say about ourselves and what kind of country we are. And so the a huge outcry against this uh, meager refugee numbers resulted in a change of policy almost immediately. And so the Biden administration announced that it was going to resettle 62,500 uh, refugees, or that's the goal anyway. And I hope they uh, do that. Um, because frankly, it's something that I found very upsetting um, for many, many years. When you talk about refugees in particular, often you hear we need to take care of our own. Sometimes I'll say, well, we need to take care of the homeless and the veterans uh, before we take care of these other people. 
uh, these people from other countries. But of course, that presents a false dichotomy. We can do both. Yes, we should uh, provide uh, services to our veterans, uh, including the Veterans Administration. Yes, we should find a solution to homelessness, to, to people without houses. Um, we should do all of those things, and we have the resources to do that. We've put billions of dollars into bailouts of banks and auto industry and uh, other uh, business endeavors. We put billions of dollars into, uh, and I'm glad we did, to a vaccine. It certainly benefited my wife and I. Uh, and so we definitely have tremendous resources in this country. And so pretending that we don't have the resources to care for people who are fleeing their homeland, not because they chose to, but because they had to. Uh, I'm really um, struck by the uh, poem by Warson Shire, who is the Somali British poet. And, and in her poem, Home, she says, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. And again, I think that's a myth that exists about immigrants and migrants, uh, that they are leaving their countries uh, for frivolous reasons. And your mothers do not uh, leave uh, our home and walk and take buses and trains and subject themselves to the hardships of traveling across multiple borders uh, for frivolous reasons. They do it because they feel like they have no choice, that life is no longer tenable for them in their home country. So um, the next thing I'd, uh, I'd like, the next policy I'd like to talk about is uh, really one of the most troubling ones, and that's Title 42. Um, I guess this is what happens when you invite a lawyer to speak. I'm going to talk of some statutes. Well, Title 42 is actually a health care law. And the previous administration, using Title IV, expelled, uh, turned away all asylum seekers, including children, at the border. Uh, the, the It was called a Stephen Miller special because it was just an excuse to turn away asylum seekers. People from the Centers for Disease Control, public health experts, no one thought that it was necessary to close the border to all refugees, that there were much less restrictive ways for us to deal with COVID than just turning people away. Well, the Biden administration changed that rule with regard to minors. And so we began accepting children, but not their parents. And of course, this resulted de facto in uh, family separation because mothers and fathers would then send their children across the border uh, alone because they knew that they would then be permitted into the United States because the parents knew that it was not safe for their children to remain in Mexico. And so they made that heartbreaking decision to separate themselves from their children so their children would be safe. But making those parents wait in Mexico is completely unjust. Uh, and again, it resulted in very unsafe uh, conditions for of the people forced to raid in Mexico. According to a letter that we just sent today, uh, over 105 different organizations, including ours, wrote the president to, to document that there are over 3,250 kidnappings, rapes, and other attacks on people blocked at the U.S. border under a Title 42 under this administration. Uh, and human rights uh, it, uh, organizations have documented the un increasing danger to these immigrants and refugee groups that are stuck in Mexico. Um, and it's also driven family separations, just as the ones that I described earlier by making the parents wait in Mexico. And most troublingly, particularly in this moment of racial awake, uh, reckoning as a country, it's disproportionately affected asylum seekers from Africa, the Caribbean, and elsewhere, and, uh, and, and including um, uh, LBGTQ asylum seekers. And so those individuals have been disproportionately impacted by Title, title 42. And so there's um, strong... Um, evidence uh, are uh, a result that is racially inequitable in, in terms of how our immigration policies have impacted uh, black migrants. Uh, and, and of course, we're, uh, we're calling for that to end. Uh, advocates are saying we should end Title IV expulsions now. 
Um, and we as, uh, we as individuals should be advocating with our elected representatives to lean on the government to change that. It's something that could be changed with a stroke of a pen by the president. Uh, the last thing I want to, the last policy I want to talk about, let's end on a high note with something that's positive. And this was one of the most damning things the previous administration did was the attorney general, originally Jefferson Beauregard Sessions, and then later William Barr, did this weird procedure of, because the immigration courts are part of the Department of Justice, so, so they're subject to the influence of the Attorney General. So the Attorney General referred case law protections for immigrant women who are survivors of domestic violence. So it was called a particular social group of women who were unable to escape their abusive partner in a country where the government failed to protect them. And so as, uh, advocates have been using a case called the matter of ARCG to protect women like that. And the attorney general in the matter of AB said that uh, that's not a social group. Those people are not entitled to protection. They're, they're just people that are suffering from private criminal actions. Uh, and it destroyed the cases of thousands of, of asylum seekers, particularly from Central America. And the administration, and we've been, advocates have been calling on the administration to end uh, that uh, since day one, and finally they've done that. So uh, June 16th, the Attorney General announced that the matter of AB was no longer the law of the land. Uh, and so we really welcomed that. Um, you know, it, I think I think it's tempting for people to think, you know, this is so much better than the pr Trump administration. So we should just be thankful for the change that occurs, and and we are thankful for the changes. I'm glad, I'm thankful that Stephen Miller is no longer in charge of these policies. But that does not mean that we should shrink from our responsibility to advocate for change and to call out injustice where we see it. Um, I want to I want to leave you with a short quote and one I hope inspires you to activism. It inspires me. And it's by the German playwright Berhold Brecht. And he said, there are those who struggle for a day and they're good. I'm looking up because I have it taped above my computer. There are those who struggle for a day and they are good. And there are those who struggle for a year and they are better. And there are those who struggle all their lives. They are the indispensable ones. I'd like to call on us to be indispensable ones. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for that wonderful, enlightening, and stirring uh, reflection about immigration. We appreciate it very much. Our closing hymn this morning is an African-American mel melody, In Christ There Is No East or West, by John Oxenham, written in 1908, and this arrangement that you'll see today by Mr. Jeff Olmsted. <laughs> In Christ there is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one glad fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. Hallelujah. Yeah.
Our closing words are by Barbara Cheatham entitled, Bring Happiness. And now we take our leave before we gather here again. May each of us bring happiness into another's life. May we each be surprised by the gifts that surround us. May each of us be enlivened by constant curiosity. And may we remain together in spirit till the hour we meet again. And now as we extinguish our chalices, please join me in the congregational closing. Let us go in peace, believe in peace, and create peace in our lives and in the world. May it be so, blessed be, and amen.